Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. Today, Ashley Coffin joins me to talk about one of the big hit TV shows of the last couple of months, Daddy Damon at, no, wait, no, sorry, A Tale of Two Queens Who Don't Get, wait, no, it's actually officially called Fire and Blood, no, no, that's the book, we're going to be talking about House of the Dragon Season 1. Hot D. Uh, Ashley Hot D. That's that's the right name for it. <laughs> Ashley has been a great fan of the show. Uh, Ashley has been a return guest uh, frequently on this podcast. You can always hear her on uh, the MCU podcast and other things. We're so excited to jump in. And we'll be back right after these commercial breaks that I don't know which house is control of, but but probably the, the, the sea snakes because they just kind of control everything <laughs> until they get killed. Welcome back. I'm Matthew, your host. As I said, I'm super excited to have returning guest, Ashley Coffin. Ash, uh, how are you doing tonight? I am fantastic. Fantastic. How are you? Good, good. Just got off a plane from Vegas, been awake for 20 hours. 23 hours, hours yeah. <laughs> this is a show I've been so excited to talk about, and I, I kind of missed it. I, I wanted to be hearing you every week, but I did get to hear you on uh, one episode of the um, PandaVision podcast, which is another part of the Stranded Panda podcast network. You were talking about House of the Dragon. You had so many good insights that I think a lot of people weren't discussing, and I just knew when we did our wrap-up episode, we had to get you on. Uh, yeah, I have just been chomping at the bit to talk about this show. I I loved the first one. I have my problems with how it ended, like many people do. But As this, do. yeah, this is just it. It just feels like what I loved so much about, you know, mm-hmm. season three, season four, season five of uh, Game of Thrones, and it's. You have writers who care, it seems like, and everybody, yeah. you know, George R. R. Martin is involved, and and you can really tell. And I, it's like they change things from the movies, but or from the books. But I haven't seen some like outcry of upsetness, and that kind of reminds me of Lord of the Rings because they changed a lot of stuff in the Lord of the Rings movies, but nobody yeah. seemed to care. <laughs> well, I think because because I'm someone who has read the book a number of times and reread it as we were watching the show. Oh, cool! I did not it. read the book. Okay, yeah, and, that, and that's fine. I like having both perspectives. I feel like it stayed true to both the the spirit of this book, which is, you know, just the, the characters, like no characters I felt had major changes in ways that like made me fundamentally change what I think of them. But even more so, it felt like it kept the focus on those characters and on what was happening rather than just as the end of Game of Thrones became like, oh, let's just rush from plot point to plot point to plot point. And I, I think what I like most about George R. R. Martin in, and his storytelling, and I think this show really captured it, is that there are very few outright good guys and very few outright bad guys. Um, there are some, you know, there's the White Walkers, and certainly there are a couple of people you love to hate in this show. <laughs> but for the most part, it's just people. And it's people who are all doing things that are often horrible to each other and that you understand why – I'm firmly convinced that every character in the show believes that they're the hero. And with a few exceptions, in most cases, even though I might disagree with them, I fully believe that and I'm – like, I understand why they would believe that. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it, it was like I rewatched a lot of the season um, and I got so much more out of it. Knowing what, because the beginning was a little slow. As uh, mm-hmm. it's not that it was slow, but it's trying to remember everybody's name. <laughs> Reminded yeah. me so much of like season one of Game of Thrones. You're like, I can't even remember the White Walker stuff that we talked about in the first episode because I'm just trying to remember everybody's name by episode six. I'm like, I don't know. This is a lot. But mm-hmm. the the way that the things that tie in with the beginning and the time jumps, it all just works so perfectly. And the. Yeah. They just, they really did it well. And it was like episode one should just be called trauma <laughs> because it really just shows yeah, you like that... you really see more of why like Allison and Rhaenyra are the way that they are. The, you know, Allison, you know, it's 100% mm-hmm. her father's fault. But like Vice Viserys is my favorite like character. I'm per- pretty sure throughout the whole thing because he is actually really good. He He's progressive. He's letting his daughter choose. He never stops being in Renair's mm-hmm. corner, even to his death. And she'll never know that the last thing he was doing was supporting her. And and that's why Allison's whole like he said it on his deathbed. Nobody believes that. He never stopped believing in Renera. And it's yeah. so 
you don't see that in any kind of old timey movie like show anything fantasy ever. And I just mm-hmm. thought it was so interesting how they did it. I love Tarkarians. <laughs> and I I love Viserys so much. I mean, A, because think about the last person we met with that name, who was just one of the few that I was talking about who were just pure, outright, awful people. I mean, they're all awful people, mm-hmm. but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's funny because I think we had nine episodes of Viserys being this like very sympathetic very honorable, fighting to do the right thing, you know, climbing those steps to the throne when his body is just literally falling apart on him. And yeah, by the end, all of us were, were A, like, give Patty the Emmy, you know, because <laughs> his acting was so good. But so many people were so rooting for him. It's easy to forget that in act, like, in episode one, he basically ordered his wife to be killed so that their baby boy could be born. In this... So- I will say, I will say, like, I got to stop you there. Go for it. The doctor said they're both going to die or you can save the baby. Right. So it's a real, and I feel like, you know, that's not an uncommon thing that happens now with, with stuff. Oh, it sure. was horrible. And he's going to, you know, he regrets that to his dying day. Mm-hmm. But if you're told like, you know, she's a hundred percent going to die. This baby is going to kill her because it cannot come out. So we can either do it this way and maybe save the baby or they're both dead. What are, like that's the hardest choice you ever have to make, I would think. Not a I mean, mother, that, for sure. I, I think I definitely got the impression that there was at least some chance she might live. But yes, I think you're right. It's it's they were both in quite a lot of danger. I watched it today. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, well, okay, the maybe thing, the maester lied. I don't know. Like they don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that's certainly possible. But to me, it's also that he does a that he doesn't tell her what's about to happen to her Mm. and so she doesn't have any part in the decision and also it's shot in such a way as to make him seem really horrible for making that decision and that's kind of more to me because i think that's very intentional because like if you go back to twitter after episode one people hated him they were so mad at him (laughs) and yet now who is and just to me his character arc is one of my absolute favorites because i think you're right i think it's that he learns from that Mm -hmm. in part because like, I think in many ways, one of the best and worst parts of him is how much he listens to others and how much he cares what others think. And that for a long time, he's listening to all these people saying, your daughter's great, but you need a son. You need a son. You have to have a son. And that's, I think, at the heart why he does that. Yeah. But then by the end of episode two, he's like, yeah, I have a son, but no, my daughter is great. And I'm going to stand by my daughter. And then he stands by her for eight more episodes. Mm-hmm. Hey, what's driving him is history books wanting to be remembered as this great king and he should be technically because there was peace during his entire time pretty much um but that that conversation he has with um otto i guess or maybe strong about Mm -hmm. you know is that what i'm going to be remembered for are people going to remember like me doing a good thing and then the fact that he doubles down on no renera is what's best for the realm like it's just this pure love for his daughter like I I wish I had a father like that you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. you see it and you're like god he was just always in her corner and she was not making things easy for him none of them are and that's the funny thing about you know families and like oh my god (laughs) it's them and I I have some friends who are the parents of teenagers of all generations, of all genders, and they are all like, oh, man, I'm so sympathetic to the to, to this guy. Like, he's defending his daughter and she's going down to, you know, the, the street of silk and all this kind of stuff yeah. and flirting with her <laughs> uncle. And, and yeah, you're right. And I, I want to talk about each of the different characters because there's so much to say. But, like, the last thing I'll say with him is, in my mind, it's not only that he's so dedicated to her, which he very much is. But in some ways, I think he has always felt that the the decision that he has to be king instead of his cousin because he's a man, mm-hmm. like it feels like he like in some ways by him making Renera queen after him, he's kind of acknowledging that maybe he shouldn't have been king, that that maybe Rainus should have been. And I think to some extent, Renera is named after Rainus very Renice. intentionally. Yeah. R- Renice, uh, and Renice, like my queen, I love her. Oh, so much so good. every single part of uh, every scene with her like n- mm-hmm. let alone her breaking out of the dragon um pits but my favorite scene with her sorry to sidetrack is at the end when no, damon is like we have this all these dragons we have this we have cyrax we have this dragon and and we have melise and she does that like quit my dragon no mm-hmm. queen work yeah <laughs> i love her 
Well, let's talk about her character next, because you're right. I think we get with her. I am mad at her, though. Well, I, I'm going to guess why. I think it's because of a single word that was not spoken. Yep. Um, but, like, again, in terms of these characters who are just so gray and so interesting, I love that it's not like, yes, there's House Green and there's House Black, but we really see characters wrestling with which side are they going to be on. Mm-hmm. And her kind of waiting to the last minute and it being with her and her husband, um, in part because I, I think it's so many times she is in such a difficult position where she yes. she is bitter that she's not queen. She's, you know, upset because she, you know, she loves her son. And in many ways, like she, I think she acknowledges that her son is gay in a way that her husband won't. Mm-hmm. And because of that, she's mad at Renera because Renera has cuckled her husband for all intents and purposes. I, mean, I guess that word's probably not the best yep. to be using these circumstances, but like you know, it was we, exactly the opposite of what happened. Well, well, <laughs> no, no, no. Get I'm it saying cock-old. from her perspective. <laughs> oh yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, this is an adult episode, by the way. There's definitely going to be well, it's an MA so show, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, yeah, that's the thing, and like. Because what she doesn't know that actually the two of them came to an agreement. Mm -hmm. But so she's in this weird situation where on the one hand, she wants her husband like it's like you're denying the truth about your son by not acknowledging that your son's kids are bastards. Like it's better for your son to to claim his children. But it's so So many levels of complexity. It's so confusing. And, uh, you know, and give it up for Renera and Damon for being so progressive. Like, hey, queens, you guys can go live in Essos and have the best life. Like, sorry about that guy we're going to kill. Uh, you know, sidetrack. But with Renice, like, not knowing all of that, she's lost everything. Yeah. They've lost so much. And now, with Luke being killed, they just lost the heir to Driftmark. And uh, Bela lost her, you know, betrothed. Like, oh, it's so sad. I don't think anyone's lost more than Renice. Yeah, and her daughter, who that, know, Bela. Herself. Oh, well, yeah. that, that's what I'm saying. She lost both of her children in her mind. Right. Like, hopefully, hopefully, Lanar comes back at some point. But I don't know. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it has been pointed out that his dragon is still on because, like, we know that dragons don't allow themselves to have another rider until their original rider is dead, mm-hmm. and so you don't know, like. Does a dragon just know someone died because someone tells it? Does a dragon have like a psychic link that like it knows Laner is still alive no matter where in the world he is? That's that's why I'm hoping um, I think it's Sea Smoke will accept his daughter. I hope it'll take. uh, Oh, that'd be great. Because in the in the scene at the end when they're like these dragons are not like have no riders. When it said Sea Smoke, it cut to either Bela or Raina. I can't remember. Yeah. I just know the two names. It's all like, God, if they could just stop naming their goddamn kids Aegon, none of this would have happened. <laughs> it's so true. So many different versions of Aegon, Amond, you know, Egg, all the different ones. But Renice, she sees that Renera is not trying to warmonger the way that everybody else was. And she's trying to hold the, the everything together. And in that moment, she then accepts that she's going to help her and guide her. But right. now... All of that is gone. We have no mm-hmm. idea. Like we, with Renee's face at the end, like where R- Renice is going to stand now might be much different than where she was at the end of that episode right. being like, we, you know, we have to be peaceful. We have to save the realm because right. shots fired. Well, and so that's actually a good reason to get into that question of the word unspoken, because I, I'm I'm going to guess that the reason you're mad is a lot of people were mad at Re- uh, Renius is because she didn't say Dracarys. Yep. She didn't command her dragon to flambe when all of House Green was just standing right mm-hmm. there. It's the Tywin um, Lannister theory. Why not kill 10 and save thousands? What's right. less honorable about that? But who knows what the repercussions would have been. She would have been the Kingslayer. She would have been this. All of the mm-hmm. credit would have gone to maybe to Rhaenyra. Um, so I do get why she didn't do it. That whole, like, I'm a, I'm a mother and she's a mother thing. I, I don't care for that theory. That's fair. I, I think in many ways what you were saying earlier to me makes more sense. It's not as much that she was a Kingslayer. It's that she, like, I think she knows that if she does that, maybe she's ending the war. But certainly she's going to call, like... If you want peace, if you want true, like, kind of a mutual, like, everyone coming together, that's not how you do it. And to me, it's more about that, like, she doesn't – if she does that, she's now committing Rhaenyra to, if not this war, to wars throughout her reign. 
because there's going to be half the houses in Westeros are going to be like, look, you you barbecued all of our leaders. Like, we're not accepting you as our queen. We're going to be in rebellion. Mm -hmm. And I know the authors have said the thing about motherhood. I'm not a mother. I'm not a parent. And so and I know some mothers who've been like, yes, I totally get that. I don't want to discount that. And I'm sure that's a part of it. But I like what you said a lot more that like, and I know you you weren't defending her action necessarily, but just that <laughs> idea of like, I think she's she doesn't want to start the war. And I think she her way of, she feels like she'd be betraying Rhaenyra if she started a war on Rhaenyra's behalf. Exactly. I Yeah, right. I agree with that. Yeah. But I still think she should have done it because <laughs> I don't want to see any more of these dragons die. I don't care about these. Like, I care about the people, but I care so much more about the dragons. <laughs> like, oh. no, because all I remember is that quote, you know, this is the war that killed most of the dragons. And I'm like, oh, like after being like, yes, the season was awesome. We only lost one that was very upsetting. And then being like, oh, shit. What this means is <laughs> yeah. all these dragons. Uh- I gotta say, yeah, we're bouncing all over the episode, Sorry. all of the season. Reel it in. That, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine with that. That's what I want to be doing. But like, I, I, I really had come to love Luke, and I'm sad to see him die. But yeah, when Vagar just like took the two of them, like you know, popcorn, throwing it into his mouth, ma- into her mouth, it was the dragon. Because, because like, you don't even see Luke. You just see like oh the God. jaws close, and Luke's dragon just be chomped a in little half. Little baby. Well, and that's where these two and these Targaryens, for some reason, are not teaching you. Daenerys knew that you do not run these dragons like dragons are not uh, servants and you go where they take you. And these kids really thought that they were in charge of these dragons. And that's where everything went wrong. And that's why, you know, Aemon, like there go that 16 going on 30. Aemon, what a snack. Mm -hmm. Mm-mm. I can't help 16, it. Oh, Ashley, he's 16. He's 20. Okay. In real life. So I loved him from the... I always, did you ever watch The Last Kingdom? No. Oh, uh, Netflix. Watch it. I loved it. Saxton's. It's the best. Uh, he's on that mm-hmm. show. So I was like, previously on. I loved him there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like at that point, like, do you own it? Do you go back and be like, I killed him? Or do you go like, I don't know mm-hmm. what he's going to do. But he knew in that moment... He started the war and he was screaming at the dragon not to do it. And that dragon breathed yeah. in the other dragon's face. And you're like, you don't control these dragons. You Have really some respect. And like what he did of like claiming Vagar the way he did mm-hmm. as a 10 year old. Like that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And it, but I think part of what I like is what and what you're, what you're agreeing with. Is what, part of what I like in that scene and that I think you're underlining is that controlling a dragon isn't a binary. Like, yes, Amon had enough of a connection and control over Vagar. Like, he respected Vagar enough that Vagar was like, okay, I'll be your partner. Mm-hmm. I'll be, like, your person. And that's a level of thing that with Vagar that most people would never hope to come close to. Right. But Vagar then was like, her blood was up. She She's a war dragon. Warrior. Yeah, she helped conquer Westeros. Grandma like, Vagar was, of three was not happy with what happened. You do not blow fire in yeah. Grandma Vagar's face if you're the size of her claw. <laughs> I also think it puts Aemon... I'm really excited to see where Aemon winds up going with this because he now has a choice. One, he can tell people that he intentionally murdered his cousin and started a war. Nephew. or Nephew, sorry, even more so. Or he can tell people that he doesn't actually control the dragon that gives him so much respect. And like... Yeah, right. Both of those are real bad for him in very different ways. And like... I think he's going to go. I think he's going to say, no, I did it intentionally because that's a lot better for him. Yeah. Well, that's what his mother would do. And that's where you get to if we want to talk about like Allison's children, Aegon, Aemon and eh, crazy girl. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, uh-huh. I do love her, though. They Helga, I think, or something like that. Hey, hey, Hagar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you watch the first episodes, like Allison doesn't love those children. She Mm -hmm. wants to get rid of them as quickly as possible. And she turns them on her, the nephews, because that, that conversation is you walk in on your son, he's jerking off onto the kingdom and you're like, cool, I got to tell this guy he's about to be king. But then you tell him that if Rhaenyra becomes queen, they're going to kill you, which would never be what would happen. You're putting all, and you know that she's been doing that to all of the children. So Aemon and, 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 uh, Aegon are just, 
You know, mm-hmm. it's built into them. You, It's conditioned. And they have no chance of not being the way that they obviously are. And if you see the stark contrast between the way Rhaenyra is with her mm-hmm. children and the love that you see in those, like the real familiness of it all, it, it just shows it's because of the way that the parent, the father treated them. Yeah. And I, I do just want to quickly say that because um, since you brought up uh, Aegon's um, showering his blessing upon the people of King's Landing, the way that that scene, him standing in the window, perfectly mirrored Tommen standing yeah. in the window right before he killed himself. Like, think about two fundamentally different kinds of kings, both of whom had wackadoodle mothers. Wackadoodle mothers. Extent, not, although in both cases, have those women having really horrible fathers. Yes. Um, but so let's get into what I think is in many ways like the biggest kind of question that the show definitely leads on, but I want to hear your take on uh, House Black or House Green. I think House you're black. on the black side. A hundred percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, n- he always wanted Renera, and that was how it was. And Allison, mm-hmm. it's Otto. I mean... God, he's so evil. I'm like, go get your peach schnapps and your pizza and get the hell out of King's Landing, Otto. Uh (laughs) But it's like, how gross? I mean, I get it. So Otto made Allison queen and he thinks that like he treats his children as tools. His daughter is a tool, but she didn't even get the choice. She is told to serve her whole life and she betrays her best friend and is so brainwashed that she has no idea that being forced to woo the king and then become his bride without telling Rhaenyra and then act the way she does with the coal, you know, the Christian coal stuff mm-hmm. is completely hypocritical. You did the same thing and you can't even blame her because it's like she doesn't even know. And it goes deeper. Yeah. Like, and that's why Lord Foot Fetish has control over her because she just has been made to serve. And you can see it coming out of her when she's picking all the skin away from her fingers in the first couple mm-hmm. episodes because pain is the only thing she has left to have control over her life. And that's yeah. why in the scene when they show Rhaenyra finding pleasure for the first time and her finding pleasure for the not pleasure, but having to have sex with the king for how many who knows they already have two kids. Right. She has no idea what pleasure is and now can't even wrap her mind around what that means. Yeah, she Sad. It's so it, it's something they do a brilliant job of in the show. And I will say this is a big change in the mo- from the book, because in the book, Allison is portrayed. Like the whole idea that Allison somehow is the one who secretly believes that the king wants her son to be a uh, queen and then like her fighting to sort of protect Rhaenyra, like that's not in the book at all. Oh. And, I, I, and I really liked it because I think like, and, and this is part of why I wanted you on the show and I think we'll talk more about this, that like this is fundamentally a story of two women and how they, of three women, but primarily these two women how they've reacted to these different situations because mm-hmm. you're right Allison does terrible things but we also know that this whole time she has been like everything she has everything she does is what she's been programmed really to do taught to do and even that stuff about the you know telling her sons oh these other kids want to kill you like the sad thing is I find I think she's the only person in the world who believes that mm. I don't think Renera. I think you're right. I don't think Renera ever thought she would want to do it. No. I don't think Otto ever thought Renera would want to do it. Um, but they know that that she's that easy to manipulate. Yeah. You know? He when he was being sent away from the kingdom, that was his last thing. He's like, "You did this to me," which she didn't. She right. just, you know, said, "I don't think that." You know, Renera told me she's still a maid, and then he put that in her head, and she's just mm-hmm. so brainwashed. I mean. We talk about grooming with Damon and and Rhaenyra, but the grooming is really with Allison because I think it takes away from Rhaenyra's character. And this is, I don't know, this is going to be a little, uh, but I think it takes away from her character to say that she is groomed because in fact, I think she really was educated and she took Mm -hmm. everything she even learned that night and turned it on Christian Cole. Like she is a learner and then she did it to Damon, I think, you know, sure. I think that they wanted to be, wanted to be together always but mm-hmm. her, her, you know, making love with him for the first time, I think that that was a calculated move to ensure that they were going to have blonde headed mm-hmm. babies or, you right. know, and, and that's why it's like, you know, maybe she was conditioned, but I think it was more of an educational thing on her side. And yeah, yeah it's, I, I want to get back to Allison eventually, but let's stay on this because I think this is a really important question. I think. Again, the greatness of the show is I think it's kind of a lot of column A and a lot of column B. Like I 
this is going to be a ridiculous statement, but I'm going to I'm going to say this. <laughs> the world tells us that among these people, they have decided that incest is in and of itself an acceptable part of the uh, relationships that people can engage in. And I think we can all kind of like roll our eyes at that or be judgmental at that. I think we're I, I, I'm not. It's not I that I'm gonna stand say that, those two so much. I have no problem saying it. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that's what I'm kind of saying. Is I'm saying like it's not that I'm like oh cultural relativism. That's their values. That's fine. I'm just saying like in order to make any sense of it, I'm only going to talk about it. I'm I'm going to put that aside in talking it's about the two of them. It's been throughout history. Because, it's not a fake thing. All royals have mm-hmm. done it, and it's just you know it's just the thing that happens. And yeah. in this story, you can see why they fucking do it. <laughs> yeah, I. And here's where I would want to stand is that I like, especially because when that first scene came out of him taking her to the street of silk, to the brothel, and then kind of like, you know, trying to seduce her himself, and then his, you know, his stuff not working, and him kind of changing she his mind on it, it all, or leaving see, her there. I think, oh, I, I saw that completely differently. I think he was mm. shocked that she was so into it. And it made him think twice about it. Oh, Because the second time that they laid together, he didn't seem to have a problem. And now they have multiple children. Right. I think Damon always wanted her. But I think oh, yeah. we get to see these little flashes of Damon like having mm-hmm. a soul. And not many, because he's a pretty bad guy. But it doesn't mean I don't right. love him. I mean, you want to see if I have daddy issues, just find out why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think in that moment, he was like, oh, shit. Because she started to take control of the situation. Right. And he's like, oh, I'm not doing this. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, like, to me, like, where I was originally going with that is, to me, like, there's a huge difference between brother and sister. I can't believe I'm saying this. Say it. Um, but yeah. There's a huge ethical difference between brother and sister and uncle and niece. Yeah. Because there's a big power dynamic difference there. Um, And I do think that the way that was set up, yes, was very, like, I'm not going to defend Damon as a romantic, like, for, you know, take taking his niece out and doing all that. Though they did shoot it in a way to make it incredibly erotic. Oh, which it, was that scene was hot. Tr- it was hot it was AF. so hot. <laughs> Which is troubling. I know, right? troubling. Hey, tell but, me you got daddy issues without telling me you got daddy issues. <laughs> right? I'm not but, saying it's okay to think that these things are hot. I just do. Because I'm yeah. Up. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of sexiness in a lot of horror movies, you know? Like, that's a thing. <laughs> um, but, but I think part of what was going on there is, yeah, I think that he was... Because you're right. She does push back. She does initiate it some... Certainly, though, there's a lot of cases where, like, you know, because of how people are sexualized and stuff like that, like, teenagers are often very, in theory, complicit in their seduction by adults. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean it's in any way less wrong by the adult. Right. But I feel like what changes it, yeah, I think I think it's that whether it's impotence or whether him mentally stopping himself, he, in his mind, as I understand it at least, for him to be the first lover of this teenage girl... And thus, like, ruin her so much, you know, ruin her socially in all of these ways. Do this thing that may hopefully understands, like, she's no ability to consent to so young. But then, when it's 20 years later, he's not going to be her first lover. He knows that she's had two, at least three, at least two, maybe more lovers. She's not this innocent young child. She's a woman of the world. And there, there is still, the, uh, I do still think there was some grooming involved, but I think that much later, they're more more on an equal plane enough that to me, like, I, I'm not going to call him like, can you please go give our sons lessons in how to be good men to women? But I'm like, I'm much more OK with them getting together as adults. And I think yeah. that's, to me, that's that's because you're right. He's he is OK with it later. But I think this that's a big part of why is because she's grown up. In yeah. So many ways. And you see such a change in him because. A lot of people were upset with that scene in the last episode where he chokes her for a second. Mm -hmm. But that's that's his inner struggle with realizing that, like, he's always been kind of a piece of shit. And he's trying it seems in that scene he's trying to kind of reel it in because the realization that you were never going to be the heir, that your brother never trusted you with the song of ice and fire and Mm -hmm. all this stuff. The only person to take it out on in that moment was Renera. But then he stops himself. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's it's such an interesting moment because it's like, yeah, to me, it, again, it's not the like, OK, you've done that thing. Now you're horribly bad forever. Yeah. It's also not well, but you have all these good reasons. So therefore, it's totally OK. You did that thing. It's it's yeah, it's that he has an awful lot going on. He responds in this horrible way. He's, but he has always 
about he killed messengers mm-hmm. in the past. He killed, he, he murdered his wife because he wanted someone yeah, else. Yeah, I mean, he is um, capable of great darkness. And, and that's, yeah. he's so complex. And that's why he's so uh, riveting on, on, like, I don't mm-hmm. know. I didn't care for him the first or second episode, but when he took down uh, the Crab King or whatever by himself, that uh-huh. not only was that the episode that I decided I was a hundred percent in on the show because that last sequence is you know I'm such a action whore. That yeah. last sequence, and he said two lines in that whole episode was everything. Mm-hmm. We got the dragons. We have a battle. We have a siege. He does it by himself. He cuts a guy. I was like, I love you. I don't care what you do. I love this show, and I am in. But we see he is by the end, by the tenth episode, such a different. He is mm-hmm. different. And it's yeah. like he he loved his brother so deeply and he trusted him. And even through all the problems that they had, Viserys never shared with him this deep, dark secret. He shared it with Rhaenyra. And I think it really broke him. And it, instead of grief or sadness, he reacts with rage and violence, which is what he's known. But then he stops and he pulls back. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, it, it, there's just so many levels to it, because I think one of the levels that I got out of it, and I, I'm curious if you saw it this way, because I mean, a lot of this is about experiences that I don't have. But I know that kind of, you know, one of the oldest tropes is like, well, you know, it's OK to love the bad boy because you're the one person who can like, you know, calm his heart. He, You can make him good. And I don't want to make him saw, good. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that that's the difference, because part of what I think happened there was Rhaenyra saw she couldn't make him like she he is a very different person, but that even with Renera, even with the person he wants, he's wanted this whole time, he's still going to go back to that place of rage and, and strike out against the people near him. Mm-hmm. I do. I, the pulling back, though, I feel like mm-hmm. and him cry like you, you see him have emotions in that last episode and then he bends the knee and that scene right. where everybody bends the knee like that was him accepting, like looking at the crown and, and handing it over was. That was like the acceptance, but, yeah. but the warmongering to come and now she's going to be a hundred percent with what he wants to do. And mm-hmm. I can't wait to see the two of them on the <laughs> same page. Everything mm-hmm. she does is justified at this point. As far as I'm concerned, her son got eaten. It's time to, yeah. time to like the, I think like that sucked. That was very messed up what happened with those kids. And listen, I love a good kid on kid violence action sequence that <laughs> you don't get to see it that much. That one was amazingly no, done. Great choreographed. Like it was crazy. I didn't expect him to cut that kid's eye out. That was wild. And yeah, you're always going to hold some kind of resentment and hatred for the person or, or people who took your mm-hmm. eye, no matter what, even though he did say, you know, it was worth it because you got Vagar. Um right. And let's just talk about that scene because that again is where it's like throw out your ideas of who's good and who's not because well, it's so brutal in the in the first part of the scene a young kid has been teased his whole life for not having a dragon now he finally gets a dragon in a way that is completely understood to be fair and a whole bunch of other kids have shown up as a crowd to bully him and possibly hurt him for doing this thing and so then I'm like, oh, I feel so bad for you, Eamon. And then he picks up a, and they're like, okay, they're getting into a childhood fight. And it's like a little, you know, and he's scared and he picks up a rock Not and cool. is like, he's escalating it. And now I'm like, maybe now I'm more on kind of Luke's side. Well, and then he immediately a, punched Bela in the face. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was, yeah, that was like, crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, but just the way that that fight went back and forth and that it was so like, again, I wasn't able to be like, oh, you're the victim. You're the bully here they're both being horrible they're all being horrible mm-hmm. uh, even like no one the bailey did not deserve to get punched but she was one of oh, the leading people yep. being so awful about it, it was the day of her mother's funeral he wasn't he shouldn't have done that that day yeah i mean that's the thing is that it's like every i can understand every kid's point of view and why they're so upset yeah and then yeah and then poor on the one hand poor little luke on the other hand knife wielding luke knife you know? wielding like luke. and and he loses his eye and like of all the things I will hold against Allison, of all the things that I will say, I think even if she you sympathize with why she does it, I think Allison does horrible things. Mm-hmm. I am not a parent. Maybe I will be one day. But I can imagine if someone like used a knife to take the eye out of my child, 
yeah, I think I demand that I get to take a knife and take out the eye. Like, and I don't think that's a good part of me. I don't think that someone <laughs> should therefore allow me to make powerful decisions when I'm super upset about my child getting mm-hmm. bl- half blinded. But like, I can't hold it against Allison. No, that moment, but you know? that's like, why that scene was so beautiful because all her life she has never been allowed to have an outburst like that. And finally, oh, it right, all so really true. bubbled over and they got to see who she was really like the real queen would cut the eye out of a little kid. And that's why her father was like, I didn't know you had it in you until that very moment. And then you cut Renera. But technically, I feel like Renera won that altercation because, yeah, she gets in her face and she's like, now they all see you for who you are. Right. No more hiding. Yeah. Including very much her husband, R- Renera's father. Right. He was, yeah. he was pissed. So talk more about th- that, and like, and we've gotten into each of the characters a little bit. We might get more, but I think, I think one of the things that a lot of people have missed about this show is how much it is a story of these two women dealing with all the things they have, each finding their own ways to either, you know, express themselves or not in these good or bad ways. And a lot of the commentary I've been hearing hasn't really gotten into that and hasn't really touched on it. And as I said, I felt even in that half of an episode, I was like, okay, Ashley gets this and Ashley sees even stuff that I'm not seeing. Talk about kind of what what you think was missing in a lot of the discourse around the show, and like what you were seeing with those two characters. So 100% the story is about Allison and Rhaenyra and them being so close as childhood friends when everything's, you know, la di da we're great friends, we're doing this. And then... When men and life start to interject and her father starts to take over and you can't have. Allison always wanted to hold on to the friendship while never acknowledging the fact that she went behind Renera's back and married her father, you know, Mm -hmm. and then the dad, you know, at least uh, you can say for Viserys, he is honest because when Renera throws it in his face about you should have married Lena Valerian if you were really caring about moving your position forward. Like you keep telling me you would have married her. And he said that that's true. And that's why he also allows Renera to marry for happiness. But even that Allison, she gets so twisted up in her jealousy of the life that Renera has gotten to live. Yeah. That she starts to make these horrible, forcing her to bring her babies to her to see what color their hair were. It's mm-hmm. insane, you know, taking on the whole septum and becoming super religious. That is all because of the things and the trauma that she had to go through as as a girl, never getting to know pleasure. And it, it's hard for people to understand that that can not knowing pleasure can really mess you up in your life. Yeah. You almost can excuse how she is, but mm-hmm. her not loving her children and giving them the love that Renera gives shows that she learned nothing but yeah. what her father instilled in her. So as much as she wants to act throughout the season that she is pulling back and being her own woman, you made your children monsters. You know, I have, uh, I've talked before, I've talked before about how as a pastor in a different part of my life, and I have a number of friends still who are pastors, including many women pastors. And many of them have told stories about how, especially when they were young and getting started as pastors, as women, the people who were sometimes the cruelest to them were elder women in the church. And that often they kind of realized that a lot of times it was, you know, women who maybe 40 or 50 years ago would have wanted to try and become a pastor, but were told, no, women can't do that. Women aren't allowed to do that. And that, you know, they kind of got into conversations and, and I heard from a lot of others, like women doctors, women, that often women in professions or women who are able, same kind of thing with like slut shaming and stuff, that that women who are able to do things that women are thought, you know, not, shouldn't be allowed to do, that other women who have been, have been kind of following those rules can be some of the cruelest to the women they perceive as not doing so. There's still patriarchy, like I'm not <laughs> saying like those are the worst, no. but like so many of my friends who said that said that like that's what they saw in Allison. You know, yeah. they saw a woman who was like, my life is terrible terrible because I'm a woman and I have to follow the rules because on some level she believes that if she doesn't follow the rules things will be even worse and over there is Renera not following the rules having all the pleasure she wants having Kristen tossing him aside having Lenore tossing him aside having her uncle you know having strong in the middle of it which god damn why didn't they, they 
they they give us uh, more of him in her in her life. We I talk know. about hotness, but that's another story entirely. He was always on uh, her side too. I love looking back through it. Ladies, you never know the man of your dreams might just be at your wedding. <laughs> And like, I, I heard someone talk about how they didn't understand how there's so much fan fiction about him and like them being so hot. And that was just from from men. And I was like, there's that one scene, not a word is spoken, but it's when all the chaos breaks out in the throne room. Yeah. At her wedding. And you just see Harlan like note what's going on and start tossing people out of the, out of the his way. His father told him to go get her. His father did. But and he's like, just like, the, whoop. <laughs> to me there was just so much dedication well and then they so met up in the alley and he let yep. her go he's like okay boy you know he's always had that little mm-hmm. so yeah yep. i would have loved to know how that yeah. happened or what happened yeah. with all that right but we had to but, jump 10 years every episode <laughs> you know fan fiction will take care of you there's I have an awful another, lot of it out there i have a, an alternate theory by the way okay what's that i think and if you know from the book don't tell me I think that Jaharis is Christian Cole's son and not Strong's. And I'm worried, not worried, but I think that Rhaenyra didn't drink the tea. I think she threw it out and I think she started to become pregnant. So I think that she maybe might have latched herself onto somebody around her quickly to, I don't know, because she was already married, I guess, at that point. I don't know. But I think that if you look at their hair and you know me with hair. When you look at mm-hmm. Luke and, and Jaharis, they do not look the same. Yeah. Luke has the strong look. He has the, the shaggy reddish brown hair. While Jaharis looks Dornish and he looks more yeah. like Christian Cole. And I'm like, oh, that's going to be interesting. It's interesting. And I, I'm going to tell you that the book doesn't say anything about it one way or the other. Okay. Really, because one of the things that I think makes the book so fascinating is... Uh, and this is uh, it, the book is written as though not it's a like a writer telling us what's happening, but the book is a book that would exist in the in the Game of Thrones. Is it universe. journals like Game of Thrones? Is it each up uh, each chapter is like a character? No, because even though it's like that's kind of like external to the world, okay. it is it, it like it's a book that Tyrion might read. Oh, it's a book written cool. by it's a maester saying and and the maester is saying like and here's what this character said and what this character oh. said. And so like like in the book, we have no idea what actually happened to Renera's first husband. It's thought Damon might have killed her, he might have died in an accident. We don't know. And wait, 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 wait. What happened to Damon's first wife? No, to Renero's first husband. Oh, that Damon killed him? Yeah. Oh. Well, that's the thing. Is that the, the idea that like they secretly faked his death so that he could, him and his oh, lover could escape. Oh, Lin- oh, is, her, oh, no way. Yeah, in the book, it's like, it is possible that he died of just warfare because uh, he, he was in a war. It's possible that Damon killed him so that he could be with Renero. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's very like, and there's a lot of that stuff. And so from what I saw on the show, I had the sense that um, Jacaris is born enough time later that Kristen wouldn't know that. Okay. Because I, I think if she has a baby within nine months, he would have been so focused. Like, he would do the math and be able to be like, no, this is not, I, He's a little you know. crazy. I don't know. He is. He definitely is. And, and. God, talk about a perfect story of the kind of like rejected lover. I know. Who like, you know, how many friends do you have? I certainly know so many who like they had a one night stand. They met someone on Tinder. It was fun. But then the guy became like really into her. Stage and like, oh, five no. clinger, baby. Right. And but it's she Kristen. and it's like it's so funny because if the roles were reversed, if you even look at Game of Thrones, like Tyrion had his lover and everybody had their lover and they had an understanding. But he he was I think he was out of line. You wanted her. I mean, she she dicked him down well. Let's just say it. Like, well, we also don't know how many more times because right. time passed. But what she was offering was pretty much what was already happening. And to be like, you should want to give up being queen and give up all of the things that you were born to do and give up that platinum press, baby, and come with me mm-hmm. and live in the fucking dirt and be a pig farmer. She's allowed to say that's not the life I want for me and offer him this yeah. other love. But the, he, the way he turned around, he was like, I made an oath. Baby, you made that oath 
before you decided you wanted to run away with her. You, yeah, she was advancing. She was a 16 year old girl or whatever at that point. You could have said no. Yep. The the blame that he puts on her and then the hatred and the insult. Oh my God. I loved him yeah. and now I hate his face. <laughs> yeah. Because it's exactly that. And A, it's that same thing of, yeah, she's 16. And so in the same way that, like, yes, she's responding to Damon, that doesn't mean it's okay. Yes, she, she like, 16-year-old girls try to seduce adults. Yeah. It happens. It's, that is never makes it okay. 16-year-olds of all genders work. try to do it. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to get into that part of it. But, like, doesn't make it okay for the adults. Um, but, yeah, but I, it was just such a perfect depiction because I know so many people who are like, yeah, like, I know that guy. I've yeah. had that guy in my life. He was horrible. And the fact that for him, it's not that he's like, oh, but I love you so much. It's that my honor has been stained. I, I, and then once she says no, both him and Allison go to this total slut shaming place of she seduced me. I gave up my honor for her. Like, it's just so bad. Singing like a canary immediately. If he would have just let that go for another 10 minutes, he just gave himself up because he's suicidal, like crazy. Hey, like Trigger, he wanted, he was like, I want you to just kill me instead of do all the, uh, send me to the wall. And then he tries to kill himself. And I'm like, red flag, red flag, red flag. But what does Allison do? She binds herself to this guy the same way she binds herself to um, Sir Foot, Sir, Sir Foot set, Fetish. What the hell? Laris. Mm-hmm. She's putting these, Laris. these people Laris around her that, you know, he can control her easily because he got her into that situation of actually killing the strongs right whether or not she knows that that's what she did doesn't matter whether she said so or not so he did that and he's going to blame it on you and that's going to come back eventually but chris getting him was a very smart move of allison yeah i wish she would just let him dick her down Mm -hmm. oh my god like she might like that this fog around her might just fly away and she's like oh that's what it's like you know yeah, I think we're basically saying that, like, in this universe, if Hitachi had had come around and invented some things, like, the whole the whole story <laughs> might be very different, you know? <laughs> well, even now, like, you know, she's like, if you've ever loved me as your queen and whatever, more, or whatever she said to him. I was like, right. what does that mean? Well, I think it's just, like, and granted, Game of Thrones is not our own world, but, you know, in a lot of the sort of stories of, like, knightly love and, like, romanticism are born out of these stories of knights who are dedicated to their lady loves, but their knights and their lady loves mm-hmm. are married noblewomen. And they're noble always women. adulterers, Lancelot, looking at you. <laughs> well, I, I, they're often, they're sometimes adulterers, but I think often at least the romanticized story version of it is that they both pine for each other and they both come so close and the woman sort of like gives him all of these favors, but not... The you favor. know the favor, and and which again, it being phrased like that, is the sexism of the time and, and our time. We entirely. didn't do it. Yeah, they did. But like, <laughs> exactly. But like, and I think that's what the truth. And I think, and here's the thing: we've talked about how she is this like puppet of so many people. She learns how to use. She now learns how to use it because I think she is. Whatever else, whatever agency or non-agency you give her for other things, I think she is one hundred percent understanding the way she is wrapping him around her finger. Mm-hmm. And that in some ways, I think, like, if she slept with him, I think it would something similar would happen. He would again feel this anger let's, of losing Or his let's mouth. run away. Right? Like, yeah. Like, remember he had that one moment where he's like, all women are representations of the mother and must be treated such. Oh, by the way, that one, she's a dirty cunt. <gasps> I know. Like, and he, he beats up her kids. Like, that kid might be yours. I'm still not done with that. But, you know, right? like, you're being me. And that's where Harwin, like, not a mother, but I understand it. When he was in there, like, you're going to treat all these kids equally. And then he beat the shit out of him. I was like, yes. Yeah. Get him. It's it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. So we, we go off at eight million tangents, but yeah, anything else on just kind of oh, like the, the, okay. the Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra, um, Rhaenyra stuff. Yeah. Finding out that her father had died and then immediately going into labor was there's so many parallels in this show of things that people fear or mock. And then they get put in that position. Damon mocking his brother and the cruel gods for what happened to his wife and then get being put in the same position. But her, you know, Lene, Lene was a dragon rider and she was not going to go out by his choice or by anybody else. She was going to go out with fire and that's how she wanted to die. But Rhaenyra, when she finally becomes queen and everything that she's supposed, you know, her council's meeting without her, where is she stuck in her mm-hmm. greatest fear that she talks about with Damon? I am terrified of just becoming 
a baby breeder and then dying in childbirth. Right. And then she, look what happened to her mother. Exactly. And her sister-in-law, cousin, nephew, I, I, whatever Lene was to her at that point. Right. But and then here you are. You just find out that your father died and you just find out that you're most likely queen and you just find out that you got um, usurped. And then you mm-hmm. go into labor. And where are you? You're stuck there. When And that was her greatest fear. And what happened to her? I don't know. We really see what that kind of, what was with the baby? It was a little strange, but, you know, there was like a little dragon baby or I don't know, because I know that's what Danny gave birth to. That mm-hmm. scene that it's so horrible and heart wrenching. And then she's up there. She's doubting herself. She's been usurped. And then Sir Eric shows up and pledges feel to fealty to her and gives her her father's crown and then everybody Mm -hmm. kneels for her and Damon kneels for her and then realizing like wait a minute people are going to see me as queen just the emotions that you would go through from morning till that you know moment uh, I can't I I, I support Rhaenyra to the end (laughs) team black no she the, the way they portray that, you know, all the, the, the things, all of her fears, all the stuff that she saw with her mother, um, her wanting to be seen in her own right. And I think even all the questions about, you know, who is the father of her children, I think further illustrates this because, you know, the reason why in these kind of noble houses, kings and queens and the idea of like that, that the woman might cheat on the man is so horrific. And it's all the way even to like Charles and Diana. This is why Diana had to be a virgin Mm -hmm. is because if you still believe in this like royal lines of succession, then you have to be 100 percent sure that the child is the offspring of the person who was born to rule. And so the the line continues Mm -hmm. with Renera. It doesn't matter who the father Mm-mm. is. It's her who the line is she continuing She is through. king, pretty much. Right? Yeah. And so, and, and like we know in the show that like when there were no living children of Eddard Stark that anyone knew about, yes, Jon Snow was thought of as a natu- like a bastard son, but still, he's still a son of Ned, so he's next in the line of succession after, you know, uh, Rickard and Bran and... Um, uh, a twit boy. Why can't I remember his name? Um, Rob, Rob. The oldest. Rob. Rob. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, and star. in the, yeah, yeah. In that same way, um, you know, it doesn't matter if their fathers are Valerian or strong. Like he, they Cole. should be the next in, or Cole, whatever the theory is, or someone <laughs> else we haven't met. Rhaenyra was, you know, she she enjoyed things, uh, and good for her. Good, good for, for her. her. Um, but like that's never. I, and, and that's. So th- that's lurking behind the surface the whole time, but it's never actually mentioned. I had an even grosser theory, and it was that uh, there was that scene where Aemond is talking to Cole about doing his, or no, he's talking to Aegon, and Aegon's like, "Oh, I gotta, you know, bang my sister all the time," because we don't talk about the fact that Aegon had to marry his sister after mm-hmm. Alicent was all grossed out and had all those problems about the Targaryens and their queer ways. Her words, not mine. She married her son to her daughter. Anyway, yep. I think one, if not both of those kids are Amons. Oh, that's because she's that's she, an interesting... she says something weird. I can't remember what she says to Amon, but it sounds. And that was mm-hmm. when I was like, wait a minute, because he was like, if I was if I was king, I would do my duty and sleep with her. And he's like, Ugh, well, you're not king and I'm going to go bang like this cup maiden. Right. So, yeah. The levels of incest are deep within the house. Sorry, it's so true. Mm-hmm. And the, like the, the intrigue, the betrayals. And so I, I'm a big believer that sometimes you can tell me how awful someone is without making me watch how awful they are again and again and again. Joffrey was a fun person to hate. Oh, yeah. But there were times when I was just like, you have made me understand that Joffrey is horrible. Yeah. I don't need to keep seeing this. They made me understand just how terrible Aegon was with like one one hundredth of the screen time. You know, I was so impressed by that because like especially that scene where they realize that not only that Aegon not only enjoys watching kids fight to the death, but this is how he's getting rid of his own bastard children. Disgusting. Like 
It's well, horrible. and that's like, why I love the twins. And that's why I like Eric, the one who took the crown mm-hmm. of the king. I was like, you two out of nowhere are amazing. And the white worm. Did you know that that was Damon's girlfriend from episode two? The one that he was yep. like, I didn't put that together. I was like, oh, yeah, there's that accent. <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't put it together. Yeah, I, I had a slight, like, I think, is this maybe? And then I went on Twitter after the episode and it was confirmed for me. But yeah, it was just like. Oh, that's uh, and her story. Yet another woman who didn't have the royal up, like all the starting places that Rhaenyra had, and mm-hmm. like I, on the one hand, like I'm so excited that we're going to keep moving forward in the story, but like I think you could have done this just this length of time in 50 episodes. You I know? know, and what's upsetting like, is like her and Rhaenyra would probably get along, but Rhaenyra is married to Damon. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Which is going to be an issue. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> The another just kind of one because I want to start wrapping up pretty soon. We're going almost an hour, uh, but there's so much more to say. One little point I wanted to make, and I want to hear some more of what stuff you want to bring up. I think one of the things they do so well is show how all these characters, Renice, Renera, um, are are kind of the ones we're we're siding with, and and that in many ways, by the rules of how the nobles are treating each other, they're I think in the they're wronged. But that doesn't mean they're good people. Like, and, and, and the two examples I'll give is like, yes, as you said, Renera and Damon come up with this beautiful idea to be like super gay supporting, super queer positive. <laughs> We're going to keep her husband, uh, let him and his lover run off to Essos and all is going to be good. And therefore no one has to suffer except for the servant guy who we're going to kill and burn that to guy, death yeah. that to make suffered. this possible. You know, and the same way like Renice is like, no, I am going to free myself and my dragon, scare the hell out of the greens, but I will be good. I'm not going to cause more bloodshed. Other than the like, you know, dozens of small folk who died when I like, you know, she burst killed so through. Many. <laughs> and it's just like, but that's the point is that those deaths aren't important to them. That's like the way we might be like, well, yeah, I stepped on some ants on the way to get here. And like, you know, and like, and even that, I'm not saying like, that's a good thinking, but you know, it's such a different kind of level. And just, it was just, again, so subtly done. Like there wasn't the character who was like, oh, but you know, what about that poor boy you killed? I know. Well, they're all like, but the realm, but the realm, Uh, you just killed 30% of the realm. (laughs) Yeah. You did. But I also feel like that might have been strategic because it was at like, you'll always be it was Aegon's thing. And mm. you want to strike fear. Like they have dragons, don't forget. You have a big right. dragon, but they have more dragons. And that dragon that right. Damon went to go sing his little song to is the second biggest to Vagar. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But still exactly. nowhere near as big. No. He he needs Vagar's- to go get Vagar. <laughs> Vagar is the last of the three. Yeah. That's the key. Grandma Vagar. Mm-hmm. Warmonger. All right, so what what are some what are a couple of last things we haven't gotten to touch on? I guess the last thing I really want to say is I, I really wish that they would have written down in the history books that that goddamn table could light up. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't write that down? <laughs> It's always my problem with prequels when they introduce cool new things. And you're like, but why didn't anyone do this? Like, Stannis literally had a priestess of fire. Why wouldn't she light the darn thing up? You know? Like, I think we never saw the kind of, like, intricacies in it. So I think the idea might be that, like, over hundreds of years that table got filled in. They just pushed candles underneath. (laughs) Yeah. I love it. I love it. Oh, wow. All right. Well, Ash, it's been so good to have you on the show. I think your voice is so important. I probably talked way more than I should have, but I'm so glad we got to hear from you so much. Thank you. Um, where else can people hear you? Because you got your own podcast. You guest on others. Uh, what's up with Ashley Goffin these days? You can always catch me at the MCU cast, Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. And then I have my podcast, which is Bill and Ashley's Terror Theater, which is all things horror movies. Um, so if you love learning about the insides of how movies are made, pretty much, even if you're not into horror, you can come check us out over there because it's not that it's really scary, but we really start from the beginning of the inception of a movie. Is that the right word? Inception? Yeah. yeah. To the end, final result in box office, and we break everything out in between. So if you like film, uh, we might be the podcast for you. So check us out there. It is a really great podcast. And I will say this because, like, I'm sure that people who are both huge into horror and very knowledgeable about filmmaking technique utterly love what you do. <laughs> I am not. But you tell it in a way that, like, 
you like I listened to you about Friday the 13th, one of my favorite movies, and I listened to you talk about Halloween. I'm hearing Halloween, uh, American Werewolf in London, which I'd never seen. And in both, I felt like I was equally informed because you do such a good job of telling people what's happening. But also, it's that it's not just like a movie review of this. It's you go into all those details, like learning all about like, you know, today in the age of CGI, we just take, you, know, you can put blood anywhere. You can do any <laughs> of this stuff. Like people had to invent all these techniques long before CGI. And you get so into that detail. And just the stories of like how Hollywood executives wanted things and other people wanted things and the directors had these images. It's just a great podcast. I definitely advise checking I love it out. That means so much. Thank you so much. Because we didn't want to just review movies. We wanted yeah. to do something a little different. And I love that it, it comes across that. Thank you so much. <laughs> it, it really does. And of course, for folks who want to uh, have thoughts on this episode, what did you think of Game of Thrones? Uh, uh, sorry. Well, Game of Thrones I part two. I call it Game of Thrones what to d- everybody. <laughs> That's fine. Fire and Blood. Hot D. Uh, da- Hot D. Dance of the Dragons. Daddy Damon and the Two Queens. Mm. Whatever you want to call Daddy it. Daddy Amen uh, and this queen. <laughs> Well, that I that's do a like the thing. younger boys, man. What can I say? I married one. <laughs> Look, you know, cougar coffin. It's that's totally so okay. Cool. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> we're gonna get a lot of great emails for this. <laughs> I'm looking forward to them. Let us know what you think. Help me convince Ashley that she needs to come back again and again because we get such great conversations. And there, also, you can find all the information about the other podcasts I do. I'm doing week by week coverage of Andor, primarily with Paul Hoppy, but also we've had a great rotating cast of guests. Um. Lots of other great stuff happening. You can find all of it by going to theethicalpanda.com. There you'll find how to find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on email, all the other podcasts, all the great things. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. So I have myself and Ashley. Thank you all so much for being a great audience and have a good day. Bye. Bye.